Mark mentioned earlier that artichokes are one of the most difficult foods to pair up with wine, and it's notoriously true. There was a reality show. I think it was Hell's Kitchen. Was Hell's no, Kitchen? no, no, it was, was uh, Top Chef. It was Top Chef first season. Uh, Top Chef first season. One of the final challenges was to put, was to put together a, a food and wine extravaganza. You know, a whole dinner. And uh, w- one of the finalists chose artichokes shirt. prominently in our dinner, and every wine person in the world smacked their head and said, "No, not artichokes." If you remember Tiffany in the in the in the finals, blew it on the artichokes. She put artichoke. Oh, oh she, it was it was just it was one of those things when, as you were watching her doing it, if you're a wine person, right. you when said, she conceptualized the, the menu, she said the word in. artichokes, and everybody went, "No, <laughs> why why are artichokes so difficult, Natalie?" Well, they have an organic acid, cinnarin that stimulates our taste buds' sugar receptors and fools us into thinking that everything we eat or drink afterwards is sweeter than it actually is, even water. So you can imagine how that plays havoc with wine. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 59. In today's episode, I'm chatting again with Mark Pascal and Francis Schott on their excellent radio show, The Restaurant Guys. If you missed part one of our conversation, go back to episode 56 after you listen to this one. Mark and Francis have been in the fine dining and wine retail business for more than 25 years and co-own Stage Left Restaurant in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which the New York Times has ranked in their excellent category, and City Search named among the top 10 restaurants in America and worth the drive from any major city. They also own a second restaurant called Catherine Lombardi, as well as the Stage Left Wine Shop. I wanted to share this conversation with you because we chat about tips on spotting bargain wines, pairing wine and veggies, including the especially tough match of artichokes, ugh, and why Canadian wine regions are excellent places to visit on vacation. This is actually two episodes rolled into one as I've been a guest on their show a number of times. I'll put links to their website, restaurants, and social media handles in the show notes, as well as a link to where you can sign up for my free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 59. Now, do you know why pairing wine to protein whether it's chicken, beef, pork, seafood, or vegetables, can end in a terrible match? I'll share the reason why and many other secrets in my free online video wine class. Save yourself a spot at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class, and you can pick a time and a date that work for you. It's lots of fun. We'll taste wine together. We'll chat about pairings. We'll laugh. We'll taste more wine together. All right, on with the show. Hi there, everybody, and welcome back. It's Mark and Francis and the Restaurant Guys. And our guest today is our old friend, Natalie McLean. She is the wine writer from Canada. Her new book is Unquenchable. Natalie, welcome back to the show. How are you? It's great to be here, guys. I'm fine. It's been a long time. You've been on the show a whole bunch of times, Natalie. Well, I think you guys like to drink as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and you're responsible for everything north of the border. Like, you have it all the way up to the Arctic Circle. You're like the wine go-to person for us. <laughs> we have to keep warm somehow. Yeah, exactly. Well, now, you've written a number of books. Your wine column, your your free wine newsletter now, I understand that, you know, it's a phenomenon, kind of like the restaurant guys, through the Internet. It, you you hit 125,000 people? Absolutely, yes. We did that, um, oh, gosh, more than a month ago. It's been really exciting now that the Internet is so pervasive, so real, not this sideshow kind of thing anymore. And, of course, there's social media. So everything really does spread quickly. And I just find the growth, well, it amazes me. 
Well, I want to ask you about the newsletter because I do I get your newsletter in my inbox and I, I don't delete you. So I'm amazed now, like you said, this what this started out as sort of a sideline thing. I think for a lot of people, it still is. You know, I go home and I write about what happened in my day or I write about wine or I write about something I'm passionate about. And I'm really a banker during the day, but I write about wine at night. You make your living writing about wine and this wine blog or, or this wine column that you don't charge for is available exclusively online. and It's widely read. How does that work in your personal life? How does that work in your professional life? Are you able to monetize that sufficiently? I'm really curious about that. Sure. Well, okay, so we have the website at nataliemcclain.com, and that's where folks can get the free newsletter. Like most people who are online now and and making a living at it, you need multiple revenue streams. So there is that old-fashioned book that just came out Mm -hmm. um, this month, Unquenchable, and my first book. So there's, there's that. There's advertising on the site. There are some folks who pay for early access to my wine reviews, although the majority, you know, do obviously sign up for the free newsletter. And then I write, oh gosh, about uh, 15 magazine columns. So when you put that all together and that's paid for work, you do make it as a living. And I think like others, it's a passion. So I'd rather cobble it together that way than take a full-time marketing job or whatever. Well, and and then not be able to focus on what you love. Exactly. Exactly. And this is, I mean, this is your endeavor. This is Natalie McLean. You're an authority on wine and writing in Canada and obviously write for all of North America. And, you know, we're online now. You write for the world. And I, as an American, get your newsletter. How is wine writing, wine buying, wine consuming, the government involvement in the marketplace different in Canada? And does it vary by province like it does here in the United States, vary by state? It does. So we've got a patchwork as well, perhaps not quite as diverse as in the United States. I'm well aware of your three-tier system that everyone cherishes there, (laughs) kidding, but some provinces have government monopolies, just as some states do. Others are privatized, and so these days, when you write about wine, you're trying to pick wines that are very widely available for everyone, and that doesn't mean lowest common denominator, but you are always aware that people have very different distribution systems and and store stocks. So you're always trying to keep that in mind when you recommend. But to that end, that is why I launched mobile apps. And in my mobile apps, of course, I have all the, the information that's on my website, including thousands of wine reviews. But what we've added to that is a barcode scanner so that when you are in a liquor store in New Jersey, you can scan the barcode. There's 150,000 barcodes in there and bring up the information on the line. So that is really, really helping, this patchwork of distribution. That's got to add a lot of value, I think, to the consumer. Absolutely. And, you know, that's, I think, what we've got to do more and more is figure out how to make the technology work for us, not work for the technology. So when I look at something, I always think, is it going to make shopping for wine easier, learning about it easier? You know, I think that's why a lot of us are gravitating towards social media. E-newsletters are still important. A lot of people still want to learn that way, but there are lots of others who don't even want that. (laughs) That They'd rather just get your wine picks or your advice on Twitter or Facebook. So you kind of meet people where they're at instead of always asking them to come where you are, like your website. Now, let me ask, with your mobile app, does this bring up just your writing on the wine or does it bring up information overall on the wine? It brings up both. So there are obviously so many wines, thousands and thousands of wines. And although I've been writing about wine for 12 years, I haven't reviewed every one. But what I've tried to do is put all of the information in there that I can, even for wines I haven't reviewed. For some, when you scan it, you will get the name of the wine, the vintage, the alcohol level, suggested matches based on the grape, and so on. For others, you'll get my full tasting notes and scores. And for yet others, you'll get both of those and community reviews for that wine. You know, so now I welcome people to submit their own take on a wine. And so that will come up as well if there are those community reviews for a wine. You know, the thing that you get there, I find that one of the problems that consumers face very often, and one of the reasons that, you know, old-fashioned restaurateurs like Mark and I and our newsletters are still really very much in demand. And one of the reasons you see more and more, especially in places like Brooklyn, where the liquor license laws allow this to be economically feasible, Little shops with 150 selections instead of the 10,000 selections you'll find in a large liquor store. One of the things people are looking for is, you know, getting a lot of information isn't hard these days. 
culling that information and making sure you have quality information and having someone to help you with the point of view or at least to share their point of view with you and to know or, or, or somebody yes yeah, somebody that you trust that's exactly the word i was going to use if if, if someone's been reading your reviews and they taste wines that that you like just like the, in the restaurants here if you if you have a bunch of wines that that i've recommended and you enjoy them you begin to trust me right and to be able to have that trust mobilized yeah, and, cool. and in a liquor store with you, I, I think, is a, well, and the, add a, and, a lot of value. And the way that if you invite people on your community to contribute to your app, well, at least you know there are other people who like Natalie McLean's taste in wine. You know, so it's, it's you have sort of a, a home base there. I think that's a really fascinating, fascinating thing you've got going on there. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you agree. And I think there is value in being selective and culling and curating, I guess, is the in word these days. Because when I invite the community to review wines on my site, I am watching every review that gets posted, not just for spam and so on, but also that, you know, the quality is there. I don't ask people to be wine experts. I am just looking for their opinions, but I am still looking at every single piece of information that is posted on my site and gets put into the apps as well. So I think that that is what people want because I think one of the key issues in the wine industry is something we call dirty data. And it's not um, obscene or anything, but it's just a lot of mixed up data. When you throw information into an app or a site, because you're trying to collect it broad scale, and you're not curating it, you're not editing it, what happens is you you know, you know start to bring up red Chardonnays from... Yeah, you know, the, the Wikipediaizing of uh, your, your website, right, right, but, where, but, where but, anybody can just jump in and but even Change Wikipedia is better policed than a lot of these wine websites. And the Dirty Data app, by the way, that's 99 cents. It's a very different. <laughs> you, you're not going to find any wine reviews there. I made I made that up. There's really no Dirty Data app. So why don't I, I bet you're wrong? So <laughs> there's none. There's none that I have any personal experience with anyway. Uh, so Natalie, let's. We brought you here onto the premises to talk of, of your new book. I should finish the title. It's Unquenchable: A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. And let's start with the, the existential questions, because the restaurant guys always start with the big questions. What is a bargain in today's wine world? I mean, are there bargains at $1,000? Are there bargains, you know, if you get a bottle of Screaming Eagle for 900 bucks, is that a bargain? Or does a bargain have to be inexpensive? Great question. So I think of a bargain as value, and that's that equation between price and quality. Quality for wine being taste. And so... What I look for are wines where you get more than what you pay for. And I do think there's a sweet spot range of, say, 10 to $20 where you can find wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost. But that's not to say that those below 10 or above 20 aren't bargains. So that Screaming Eagle could be a bargain for some folks, you know, at the right price, because it's all about what kind of price quality ratio do you want I just think, though, that there's a certain point, and it's not a hard line, but call it 30 or $50. Above that, you start to pay for intangible factors when it comes to a bottle of wine, like prestige and rarity and collectability, the intangible. So you're paying for what somebody else wants, not exactly for what you're getting. But not for necessarily what you're going to experience in pleasure on your palate. Exactly, exactly. And so I'm trying to help people spot the bargains because, you know, there's so many factors contributing to the fact. I mean, everyone loves a bargain no matter what, but, you know, we've gone through a recession. A lot of us have traded down and realized we didn't have to give up great taste. We could still find really good bottles in that price range and don't see the need for trading back up. I mean, I think people still like to splurge occasionally and, you know, for dinner parties or whatever and go higher. But I think if you're someone who loves a a glass of wine or two with dinner, that's, often the price range you're looking at. And remember, Natalie's talking about wines here in a retail store. So the number she's giving you in a restaurant, you would expect to pretty much double. Exactly. Yes. So the, right that, on. So you're looking for a range. Natalie's talking about wines in the 20 to $40 range and wines in the 60 to $100 range if you were in a restaurant. Right. So I think there's an interesting point there about finding wines at a lower price point. I want to say that one of the things that's happened, we have about 900 selections on our wine list, right? And they range from $35 a bottle to, you know, over $3,500 a bottle. And we've found some folks at different points saying, oh, my God, so many of these wines are so expensive. And indeed, in our 900 selections, we have 150 selections under 50 bucks. I mean, 
if that was the whole wine list, that, I mean, you know, you'll find restaurants don't have 150 selections, 150 bucks. And people often say, well, you know, you have so many expensive wines. I'm like, listen, there, there are 150 wines here that you can find that are relatively inexpensive. And they say, well, do you put as much thought into the less expensive wines than as the high end wines? And Sometimes I say, more. And I say, you know what? If you just say to me, Francis, I'd like you to find a great bottle of wine for your list and you can spend $150 a bottle on it. It's not that hard, to be honest with you. <laughs> right. You know, but you want to find a great bottle of wine on your list that's going to make say, somebody say, wow, for 35. You know, we put as much care and love into that, and we're as proud of ourselves as we can be when we find, you know, I got a Trebbiano de Bruzzo and a Montable Chiano de Bruzzo that are, are the least expensive wines on my list right now. They're amazing. Yeah, they're great. And your book captures a lot of the spirit of this. It's the quest to go out and find you know, maybe not the Hope Diamond, but, you know, to find a, a, a ruby in your own backyard. Exactly. And, and that's my thought. It's, it's the thrill of the hunt. And anyone, as you said, can slap down a hundred bucks and get a great wine. But it does take a lot of savvy, actually, to hunt out the gems that do taste terrific in that bargain price range. And I think similarly, when it comes to making wine, it's pure snobbery to think that only winemakers who make the badge wines of over $100 are the ones who care most about the winemaking mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. I think those who are trying to make terrific, affordable wines care just as much, if not more, because they have fewer resources to work with. Maybe they don't have the expensive French barrels or whatever. So I think we're realizing that you know, as wine consumption increases and people become more knowledgeable about wine, there's that dawning of, you know... <laughs> Actually, it's just fine to look for a great price quality ratio because, you know, inexpensive doesn't mean cheap anymore. So in Unquenchable, Natalie, how do you go about finding the bargain wines? What is your methodology for filling 200 and some odd pages with bargain wines? And what do people learn? Not only just the wines that you recommended, but how you went about finding them and what you categorize as a bargain wine here. Well, first of all, I'm a very thorough and hedonistic researcher, so there was a lot of drinking involved or a, a lot of tasting. A hell of a job, Natalie, but somebody's got to do it. It starts with really liking wine. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's got to be the beginning. And then proving it. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, that's the difference between writing the book today and my first book back in 2006, Red, White, and Drunk All Over. I was able to better crowdsource it, so to speak, through my website at nataliemcclain.com because I was able to ask those 125,000 people where they thought the bargain regions were for wines these days. And so I narrowed it down from there. I had thousands of emails back. And then even within the eight regions that I picked, I was getting their suggestions for wineries to visit. And with these, what I was looking for is not just a great bargain wine, but a great story. Because I think that in telling the story of people in the wine industry, passionate, colorful, obsessive, iconic, I could better tell the story of wine itself and that you would be carried along with the narrative and and then realize at the end of the book just how much you had learned. So what I did was look for those terrific regions. And at the end of each chapter, there are insider tips as to why those regions make for great bargain wines. And so one of them, for example, one insider tip is go south. And so often in traditional wine producing countries like France or Italy, you will pay a lot for the wines in the northern regions. If you think Bordeaux, Burgundy, Tuscany, Piedmont, you go south to Languedoc, Provence, and uh, Sicily, which are all in the book, that's where the bargains will be. Interesting. Um, Yeah, because they've been producing wines for hundreds of years just as well, or just as long, but they were always known as the country cousins, very rustic and so on. But the methods have improved, and now they're getting better exports, and they have fewer rules that increase their costs as their northern neighbors, so they represent terrific bargains on the shelf. And, you know, your book also has a certain travelogue quality to it as well. Oh, good. Yeah, I tried to keep in the armchair travel. Whether you're going to eventually go to the wine regions I'm describing, or even if you don't make it, I think people really do love that. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I write about wine and, and not plumbing parts. It's because vineyards are always in gorgeous regions of the world and and they make for wonderful vacation destinations whether you're visiting vineyards or often there are terrific restaurants associated with the wineries and so on so i really did want to keep that aspect pretty strong in there on this book as well 
Well, you, you talk a lot of, and Francis and I mention this all the time when in talking about wine or food or, or whatever experience you talk about. Anytime you contextualize an experience, anytime there's a story that goes with it, you have a better ability to remember the details of that experience. And if the details are good, that will help you remember the, the, the great experiences you had while you were in the south of France or, or the south of Italy or even southern California. Exactly. And that's what I was searching out with the people, people who would say memorable things, either they were witty or they were philosophical or something, because they helped me put that place in my mind. And, and that's what I was looking for for my readers. So, you know, when I went to Australia, there's the colorful Wolf Blass, who's really a, a, a going concern in his mid 70s. And I'll never drink another glass of his wine without thinking of him because he's just so well, he was a bit randy, actually. But really? <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a uh, well. He has a um, uh, red label Cabernet Shiraz, and you know, he's uh, the whole interview was a wink and a nudge, and he was just uh, really colorful. But he was pouring this one in his tasting room. He goes, "Oh, I call this wine the leg opener." Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Really? <laughs> um, so, but uh, you know, he, it's just when you meet people like that, you remember the place and the wines forever. And I think that's why we travel too to really implant those sensory memories in our minds. All right. So I have a question for you. You are traveled the world looking for bargain wines. Uh, here's something I think is really valuable to consumers. How do they spot inexpensive wines that are terrible? But in a pretty package, are marketed well. How, how, what are the terrible, cheap wines that are really just cheap and not a bargain at all? <laughs> Look for gold embossing. No, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish there were uh, one or even a few simple tricks to remember. It's hard these days because you know wine marketing has gotten very sophisticated. It's as sophisticated as any other packaged good these days, especially with mass producers. And not that mass producers only produce terrible wines. So I think. I try to advise the reverse. So try to develop a repertoire where you know they are good wines at reasonable prices. And so, you know, back to those insider tips, another way to spot a good wine is, say, a region that had a dismal reputation a few decades ago, but now is really working hard to repair that reputation. And I think of Germany is one where we had the the sweet syrup behind the uh, high school portable, perhaps. Today, they produce zippy, dry Rieslings, wonderful food wines. Well, a lot of the labels are still difficult to read if you're a total English-speaking person. But if you start to get familiar with their wines and their styles, you will always pay just a fraction of the cost that you would for other great white wines. Another region would be South Africa. They were out of our market due to apartheid for, like, for years. And so they are still trying to make an inroad into our market. That's another one to look for. Another insider tip would be go where it's warm because they have fewer costs. You look at Argentina and Chile. It's a great vintage every year. They're not battling cold and mildew and rot. Labor is inexpensive. Land is cheap. Hmm. Um, So they've got natural cost advantages. You know, all of these places, I think it's all good advice. Yet none of them would lead you to Canada. Is there any nepotism (laughs) going on? There's a Canadian wine section in your book here. Is that uh, a little bit of national pride there, Natalie? (laughs) <laughs> it is and it isn't. The reason I included Niagara and, you know, I could well have included Upper New York State as well with that, is that the wines there, the quality in the bottle, if you compare that to benchmark wines from around the world, is pretty amazing. So in Niagara, of course, we got on the wine map for our ice wines, our dessert wines. But if you look at the dry table wines, especially Riesling and Pinot Noir, And I focused on Pinot Noir, the heartbreak grape, because it's so difficult and expensive to grow. Because I think when you buy a bottle of Niagara Pinot Noir and you compare that to Burgundy, I know they're different styles, but you're going to pay a fraction of the price. The challenge with Niagara and a lot of other wine regions, including many states in the United States, is that we don't produce enough to export great volume. So you're not going to see Canadian wines all over the United States. So you're basically only sending us your crap. (laughs) <laughs> you have to come visit us. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> That's the armchair travel bit. You're going to have to come up and see us sometime. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know, another place that Francis and I have found bargain wines, and I'll, and I'll use that in quotations because sometimes... By the way, I just want to point out to everyone on the air that you can't see it because Mark doesn't realize you can't see when you put something in air quotes. Uh, I, did air, I did air quote there. quoting on the radio. <laughs> but, uh, Very I air quoted bargain wines, and I'll do it again. 
<laughs> uh, but but quote unquote bargain wines because sometimes they're very expensive. But one of the things that Francis and I have found are sometimes great producers in what will be declared an off vintage will have to lower their prices because just the vintage won't sell for whatever reason, but sometimes they'll offer still really wonderful wines. Exactly. They'll declassify their wine into a second label sometimes, and it's because they want to keep the reputation of that flagship brand pristine and consistent year after year if they produce enough. But that's, that's a great insider tip as well. Look for the second labels or the declassified wines because you're getting that same expertise. It's just because they had such high standards, it didn't quite make it into the, the lead wine. This is kind of girly, but I think of it as like Max Mara and Max Mara Weekend, where so you have a second label, like a lot of the Ocature designers have a second label, much more affordable, and yet you're still getting that quality of craftsmanship. So I'm guessing that the other men in the audience are as lost as we are. Uh, <laughs> Prince and I just look at each other and we're like, huh? what kind of wear? Well, I think we, okay, got it from, we got it from context, though, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Natalie, I, I want to go back to talking about your website just for one minute. Just something that, that I see, and, and Francis and I judge wines, but we generally don't give them a score. Do you feel pressure to kind of race to the market with your scores on a new wine just because you want to be the first person to judge something to get a score on it? I don't feel a pressure to be the first. I feel a responsibility to be comprehensive so that when you're in the liquor store, you're more than likely going to find lots of wines I've recommended because that's what people want. That said, if someone sends me a new bottle, you know, a fresh off the bottling line, I'll post my review as soon as I can. But, you know, I, I think the greater service is to have reviews for most of the wines you're likely to pick up in the store and go, I wonder if this is any good. You know, it's way too much work, but Mark and I have often toyed with the idea of coming up with our own scoring system. You know, it used to be the 20-point scale, and then Robert Parker and, and the Wine Spectator innovated with the 100-point scale, which made wine writing a lot more accessible to a lot of folks. And then I think people obsess a little too much on scores. I think so. Mark and I want to come up with the 124-point scale, right? So think think of how great that would be. How many wines over 100 points? Like, I only have 100-point wines in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> hey, Natalie, your book is great. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been great chatting with you guys. Natalie McLean's new book is Unquenchable, a tipsy quest for the world's best bargain wines. You can find out more about Natalie, her book, and her website at our website at restaurantguysradio.com. That was fun. She's, she is fun. She is She is fun. She, she makes wine fun. She keeps it in perspective. Yeah. She doesn't take it too seriously like you should be. When, when you're talking about wine. And, I, I, I want to get her app, actually. I want to oh, get her I th- I'm sure it's great. I want to I'm, get her I'm, app. I'm sure it, it, it really is terrific. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to The Restaurant Guys, Mark and Francis of Stage Left and Cafe Lombardi Restaurant. We are being joined again by a, 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 who's becoming a regular guest on this show, Natalie McLean. Natalie McLean has written the book Red, White, and Drunk All Over, A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass. She's one of the world's most respected regular writers and journalists on food and wine. Natalie, welcome back to the show. Hi, Mark and Francis. How are you? Hey, we're doing great. Really good to talk to you again. Oh, nice to talk to you guys, too. Well, you know, we get your newsletter. Uh, now, you're a Canadian wine and food writer, which means that you don't write exclusively about Canadian wine. But you do have a passion for Canadian wine, isn't that so? I do. You know, we've got a a vibrant, thriving, but small industry here. And so we're renowned for our ice wines. But we also make some terrific dry Rieslings and Pinot Noir. And we're driving distance from New Jersey, too. Well, most of most of our fans don't know that I was actually born in Canada. Oh, really? Whereabouts? I was born in Montreal. Oh my goodness! Way back that's... when, my my dad was working for General Foods up there, and so that's oh. that's from where I came. Surrounded by Canucks, I am. <laughs> <laughs> moved here, moved here very early, uh, very early, or very early in my life. We moved oh, to back to the states. Now, is the wine industry in Canada, Natalie, a tourist destination? One of the things that's happened around here, I think, the most vibrant East Coast wine destination right now is Long Island, both because of the quality of what they're producing, and because of their proximity to New York. I was out. On Long Island, a friend of mine has a, a friend of ours actually, Barbara Shin and David Page of Home Restaurant and now Shin Vineyards in Long Island. They have, I think, one of the best vineyards out on Long Island. And they opened a B and B and they did a friends and family run where they invited me and a couple of friends up for the for the weekend to just sort of chest everything out. I know it's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I was really glad to help them out while they made me breakfast. But there was actually so much traffic on the main road in Mattituck 
and there were limousines and buses, and I felt like I was in Napa Valley. Wow. Um, is there that kind of tourist draw to Canadian wine destinations? There is. It may not be as busy as that region, but definitely Niagara offers a lot in addition to the wineries. A lot of the wineries, of course, have fabulous restaurants attached, so the wine and dining scene is very much complete, but it's a beautiful region for camping, picnicking, that sort of thing. And then it also has the largest George Bernard Shaw Festival in the summer, which attracts thousands of people. So right in Niagara on the Lake, there's the Playhouse. There's several theaters going concurrently all the time. So a lot of people will plan a whole vacation around that between all of those aspects that it has to offer. So, yeah, we're getting lots of, of tourists that way. Well, let's talk about world wine now, and, and the Canadian wine market is very similar to the American wine market. And, you know, we're talking about the Niagara region being in the northeast. Uh, we have a similar climate. Let's Yours talk- is a little colder. I can attest to that, Natalie. <laughs> yes. Let's- One of the few blessings of having a consistently cold climate is that we are the world's largest ice wine producer. I keep telling you that <laughs> myself that in the middle of March. <laughs> Natalie, all the pictures of me as a two-year-old, I'm very bundled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See two little eyes peeking out. <laughs> well, well, one of the things that a uh, restaurateur named Paul Greco, who was uh, who's a friend of ours, and he owns a restaurant called Hearth, and he now has a new restaurant. But one of the things that he does very, he's an innovative wine uh, sommelier and wine salesman. He works the floor of his own restaurant. One of the things that he does is he arranges his wine list seasonally. And so he'll say, these are the wines for summer, these are the wines for fall. And then, you know, as the seasons pass, he'll put wines on sale that are sort of going out of season. Well, that's that's a very interesting way of looking at it. I think almost any wine you can have in any season of the year. But there are certain wines that go with the seasons. You have a take on that as well. Why don't you share it with us? Sure. I think there's two factors to consider when we think about winter wines versus summer wines. And I think about them maybe like your winter wardrobe and your summer wardrobe. So you want to put away all the woolly sweaters, and woolly sweaters in the world of wine are your big, heavy, alcoholic wines that will warm you up in the winter, go with hearty, you know, meats and and warm dishes. But in the summer, I think the last thing you want to be sipping out on the deck when it's, you know, really hot outside is a hot, alcoholic wine. So that's one factor. We're looking for lighter wines. But, Natalie, when I wear my winter clothes, I'm mostly just trying to cover up the extra 15 pounds. (laughs) can't help you. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. but let's talk let's talk for for those who might know the kind of wines that Natalie's talking about, big alcoholic wines. And when wines can really vary in alcohol, I mean a German Riesling might be 7, 8, 9% alcohol and a Cabernet from California might be 15 and a half percent. Or a Zinfandel alcohol. might get up to 16. I know so, there's such a range these days. Well, so but you as 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 wine drinkers need to be aware when you're drinking wine, especially considering drinking and driving and how you want it to affect you and how alcohol affects you in the heat. You can have two bottles of German wine and have the same amount of alcohol enter your system as one bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon if it's a very powerful Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's the kind of thing Natalie's talking about. So Absolutely. So we put away those big woolly sweaters, and and what kind of wines do we look for in the summer? Well, and the bonus is that, you know, if we do go for the crisp, lighter wines, they go with the foods of summer. So if you take that German Riesling or other crisp whites, they're going to go really, really well with our summer salads, our seafood, grilled veggies. Those are all nice pairings because of the complementary flavors and weight, both of the wine and the food. Well, we eat lighter in the summer. I want to come back and talk with you about vegetables, which you mentioned, which we hopefully should be eating a lot of, but which actually are not the easiest things in the world to match with wine. And that presents us with some unique problems, doesn't it? It does. I love veggies. And, you know, as a determined hedonist, I will not give up on wine with vegetables. But you've got a couple challenges. First of all, red meats tend to go with wine because they have proteins in them. So the proteins in the, the meat will bind and dance beautifully with the tannins, say, in a red wine. In veggies, you don't have proteins. You have herbaceous flavors. You've got a range of acidity, very challenging elements for wine. Well, I mean, things like artichokes foil yeah. almost every wine in the world. Oh, well, that's a special case. Let's talk about that after the break because that's a really cool thing that goes on with artichokes. It it does. But, so, but, but, okay. but, but, but vegetables in general, yeah. what should we be looking to? Because people are going to be listening to this show, going to go to the liquor store and look for a bottle of wine or go to a restaurant and look to order a bottle of wine. What should we be looking for with our 
crudite with our vegetable plates, what should we be looking for? Sure. Summer so, by the pool. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to knock out the really tannic wines, the alcoholic and oaky wines, because they're going to clobber vegetables. So and even big oaky chardonnays we should avoid? I would, unless you're talking about a starchy vegetable like pumpkin or squash or potato, but those are kind of winter vegetables Which are more anyway. Fall, winter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if we're talking about the green veggies, we're going to look for crisp white wines tend to do better than red wines because of the lack of tannins. But also we're going to look for white wines that have an herbaceous herbal character themselves. So I think of Austrian Gruner Veltliner is a good choice. Excellent. Yes. My favorite, in fact, I call it the veggie wine of the century, is New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. It's like summer salad in a glass, in liquid form. So what people need to get over, I think a lot of people out there have this idea that for it to be a delicious quality wine, you know, you put your nose in the glass of that Kendall Jackson Chardonnay and you smell that oak. That may work on its own and be something that you like, but it may get a little messed up when you have that with vegetables. And maybe a Sauvignon Blanc doesn't immediately appeal to you when you put your nose in the glass because it smells a little grapefruity and it doesn't have that, that some, familiar and, oak. And sometimes it'll have a, that, those grassy notes to it, too, but, but those grassy notes happen to go great. With vegetables. Exactly. So it may not be the wine by itself you may not like as well, but when you have it with your dinner, you need to be a little more careful and at least have a bottle of that around. Mark mentioned earlier that artichokes are one of the most difficult foods to pair up with wine, and it's notoriously true. There was a reality show. I think it was Hell's Kitchen. Was Hell's no, 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 it was, was uh, Top Chef. It was Top Chef, first season. Uh, Top Chef, first season. One of the final challenges was, was to put together a, a food and wine extravaganza, you know, a whole dinner. And uh, w one of the finalists chose artichokes chef. prominently in our dinner, and every wine person in the world smacked their head and said, "No, not artichokes." If you remember Tiffany in the in the in the finals, blew it on the artichokes. She put artichokes. Oh, oh she, it was it was just it was one of those things when, as you were watching her doing it, if you're a wine person, right. you when said, she conceptualized the, the menu, she said the word in. artichokes, and everybody went, "No, <laughs> why? Why are artichokes so difficult, Natalie?" Well, they have an organic acid, cinnarin that stimulates our taste buds' sugar receptors and fools us into thinking that everything we eat or drink afterwards is sweeter than it actually is, even water. So you can imagine how that plays havoc with wine. Every wine that you have after an artichoke is going to taste almost cloyingly sweet. And so the Italians are very clever, one of the world's largest producers of artichokes. They came up with a bitter tasting aperitif called Sinar, but we can take a, a lesson, I think, from them in the style of wines that we choose with artichokes if we are bound and determined to have wine with them. And that is look for austere, bone-dry whites. So from Italy, you could choose Verdicchio, or you could go with a, a Chablis from Burgundy, or even a Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley. All of those, because they're bone dry, they're going to come up a level in the sweetness perception, but they're going to go nicely or as well as can be expected <laughs> with artichokes. Just uh, FYI to those of you out there, if you, another great compliment with artichokes are cocktails. We make some cocktails with Cinar in them. Actually, it's a liqueur that comes from artichokes that goes great with artichokes. I will tell you that the liqueur, is it Cinar or Chinar? Do we know? I hear both pronunciations. Not well, quite sure. Well, it's one of those two. Yeah. But the lick, but the <laughs> it liquor, might be both of them. I have to say, the liquor... We got it in for some cocktails. Actually, there was a, a cocktail in a, in a book we started using Chinar because it was in a book called Cocktails of New York written by Anthony Giglio. And, and this is a cocktail that was they came up with at one of Mario Vitale's restaurants, and we really like it a lot. But when we ordered the Chinar, our liquor salesman, who we've been doing business with for 15 years, said, nobody's ordered that in the 15 years I've been here. <laughs> Hold on a second. I think we have a case, and I think we had a case of Chinar from 1976. I'm fairly wow. certain that I was glad it was in a We're sealed We're the bottle. only people using it, you know, except for, you know, in real Italian neighborhoods. But it, it, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. So artichokes, we want to go with bone dry because artichokes are going to make things taste sweeter. My view on artichokes is Gruner Veltliner is the only thing that really works with artichokes. Yeah. But we can also, when we have artichokes on a salad or something, how can we change it and prepare it differently to, to sort of mute the negative effects on wine a little bit? Well, you can take the raw edge off artichokes by cooking them slowly in an acid-based liquid like lemon juice or vinegar or wine, and that's going to decrease that compound's content and turn the starches into sugar. So this will deepen their flavors and make them more wine-friendly, or you could roast and caramelize them. That, that's all going to help and, and take that harsh edge off of them. Well, now let's turn our attention to we're talking about the wines of summer. Let's think about how we drink the wines of summer. I mean, 
I pride myself on drinking many different ways, but in the t- in summertime, we'll have people over in the backyard, and we just we want to crack some bottles of wine and have them out there. How do you suggest that if you're having wines at home, that we deal with having wine available to serve to people, having it be the right temperature, having enough, having you know, do we have to leave our own corkscrew out there? Or are we obligated to open the wines ourselves? How's it work? Well, you know, I I learned a, a valuable or expensive lesson a couple years back when I had. A casual outdoor gathering for about 30 people, and I set all the bottles of wine out on a table in the sun. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and they were just, um, yeah, well-aged vinegar by the time the day was over. So these days I'll put out one bottle of red, one bottle of white, so that they feel that they can help themselves and don't have to keep asking, especially if it's a sort of milling around kind of gathering. But then I'll just keep replenishing them, but keep the white in an ice bucket and the red in the shade or in the house because reds can get far too flabby and warm in the summer. Because you know that old advice about reds at room temperature? That goes back to, of course, medieval castles, and that was a lot cooler room right, the temperature. Room, the room was 68 degrees. Exactly, exactly. And so a lot of reds in restaurants, some restaurants, are served uh, too warm, and I'll have them put, put it in an ice bucket if that's the case. But that's a, that's a real consideration in the summertime when – if you're just, you know, got the red out there on the deck, it can really heat up. Well, we talk about the alcohol content and, and that we're looking for wines with lower alcohol in them. You take one of those wines that's even only only 12, 13 percent alcohol and you put it in the sun and you warm it up to 70 or 80 degrees. Well, all of a sudden you start perceiving a lot more of that alcohol. Because the alcohol is volatile and at that high temperature, the alcohol comes off the nose really quickly. Plus, the fruit gets all flabby and the tannin sort of fades. Yeah. So temperature is really important. One of the things that I see suggest people do with red wines if you're having something in the backyard it's not a bad idea to have if you have a you know an ice bucket for the white wines but if you have some sort of bucket or some sort of vessel and you can put a little layer of ice in the bottom of it and a little bit of water in the bottom of it and throw a mm-hmm. towel some over cool it cool water it or something yeah. out of the sun it you know like you said natalie to serve a red wine at 68 65 degrees even is delicious. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, Natalie, you talk about going to some restaurants where you you ask them to put your wine, your red wine, on ice. More than one time, somebody's looked at me for, like I'm from another planet because they served me a 78 degree bottle or worse wow. bottle of red from Off the back of the bar from their cellar, which is happens to be next to the the compressor for their refrigerator. <laughs> and you know, they brought me some some scaldingly hot bottle of red. Well, the only thing I can do that can possibly make that wine palatable is to put it in ice as quickly as I can and get it to the right temperature. And, and, and out there in listener land, you'll often very see a wine knowledgeable person when a wine is presented to someone, they'll take their hand and put it on the bottle and touch it. Right. And the reason we do that is because sometimes you touch it and you realize it's 78 degrees. Now, if that's an old burgundy, Send it back and order a cheaper wine. Exactly. But if that's if that's a you know a big cab or a Zinfandel and it's not too expensive, uh, you know maybe it'll be okay. It certainly w- isn't better for having been at 75 degrees wherever they kept it. But you might say you know what just at that point what I would do is say you know pour me a little taste to make sure the wine's okay and then drop pour us all just a little teeny bit and then put the re- put the bottle on ice for five minutes. Not like it's a white wine for a half an hour, but put the bottle on ice for five minutes. And if you drop that five or six degrees. Isn't that a huge difference in the way you'll enjoy the red wine? It is. Oh, it is. All the flavors come into balance. And as you said, you know, too hot and all that you smell is the alcohol. So, you know, wine should be refreshing, whether Mm -hmm. it's red or white. And similarly, I would do that test that you're mentioning with a white wine. So especially if you see that bottle and it's, it's just covered in condensation, like it's been hauled out of a really cold fridge, touch that too and see... If, if the wine actually needs to come up a bit mm-hmm. in temperature. Well, and the other thing, though, is what's funny is if, if a wine is three degrees too hot, it really can ruin it. But if it's mm-hmm. seven degrees too cold, it, first of all, it can still be great if it's a couple of degrees too cold. And when you pour it in your glass, even if it's 10 degrees too cold or 12 degrees too cold, it's going to warm up in the glass in yeah. five minutes. And don't, yeah. be, don't be afraid to ask somebody to leave your white wine on the table and not put it back on ice. There are a lot of white wines that drink better at 55 even 58 degrees than they do at that 45 or, or even colder sometimes if they come out of a wine And cellar. if the wine comes up a little cooler than you want, that's okay. Don't blame the restaurant. That's, that's fine. That means yeah. it was because it should be stored cool. Sure. Um, and, and you let it come up. But if the wine comes out warmer than you want, well, that's, that can be a bit of an issue. Well, I just want to give one more piece of advice. And that is, you know, sommeliers are 
very different, just like all segments of the population. Some of them are very helpful. Some of them are left help, less helpful. If you ask to put your red wine on ice and your sommelier gives you a dirty look, stop taking his advice. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. You have touched on recently, Natalie, and you have a, a newsletter that's a great wine newsletter. But we've talked about recently one of my pet peeves. We go to a lot of weddings in the summertime. And one of the things we kill ourselves over, kill ourselves over at both weddings and on New Year's Eve is if people want to do a champagne toast, we push it till the very last minute. And then we fill all the glasses of champagne or half a glass of champagne or whatever the host wants. And then we run them over to people, whether it's right before the champagne toast or right at midnight on New Year's Eve or it's right before the best man gives a toast at a wedding. We just kill ourselves. It takes every staff member off the floor for 15 minutes. But I think when you do a champagne toast, it can't be good luck to do what most restaurants do, (laughs) which is they pour the champagne as the guests are arriving, or an hour before the guests or arrive. Six days before you got there. So <laughs> what most weddings are toasted with, a warm glass of flat champagne. Oh. <laughs> um, congratulations. Yay. Start your life. <laughs> yeah. Hope the marriage goes better. <laughs> so so uh, w- what is your advice for serving champagne at weddings and at summer parties and things like that? Are we crazy to be so focused on making sure your champagne is chilled and bubbly? Well, you know, I do think champagne's better enjoyed cold. As you know, as... as a, as bubbly warms up, it loses its effervescence, and, and it's just not a great drink, I think. It's not as refreshing. But you're right. The logistics can be tough on that in terms of getting everyone topped up. That's why, you know, I prefer dinners that start with the toast so that, you know, everybody may be milling around at the reception. Then they come in, sit down, let's do the toast first while the bubbly is cold, fresh, and bubbly. I think that works well, at least the weddings I've been to. That's been a nice way to start. But the only other advice I'd have for people when it comes to weddings and bubbly is that you don't have to serve French champagne. There's so many choices out there in terms of bubblies from other regions around the world that are half or a third of the price and and just as delicious. Well, there's some some great cavas from from Spain, and obviously Mm. California has some sparkling. Or from the Loire Valley. Mm. or Generally, I'll I'll give advice to people who are planning a wedding or planning a, a large event with lots of family members. And that advice is almost always, don't blow your whole budget on the wine or the sparkling wine. And I, and I, I know you kind of feel the same way, Natalie, about, you know, some of the people at your party are going to really appreciate it, but most of the people at your party probably won't. Are, are you better off in the middle, at the low end, at the high end? What do you think about that, Matt? I would stick to the mid-range. I agree that not everybody appreciates wine, but I've also been to weddings where there was some pretty dreadful stuff. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think if you hit right in the middle, you can choose uh, bubblies from other countries that are are more value-priced than, say, French champagne. And then with the wines, there's so many great values out there these days, whether it's from Chile or Australia or lesser-known regions of California – you can really get some good stuff in the, you know, the ten to twelve dollar range, even. So your advice is to not serve the top of the line, but avoid, but the, be, but but avoid it, the plonk as but well. But it should at least be made from grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helps. That really helps. Now, I'm a, I'm, Mark and I are huge fans of toasting. I'm more than Mark. We uh, we used to belong to a lunch club called the Red Meat Club with a bunch of foodie friends of ours. For ten years, we would go and we'd have lunch on the second Monday of every month. And every member present, sometimes up to forty people, would have to give a toast, beginning with the newest member. And so we got pretty creative with our toasts. Do you think toasting is important with wines, just at weddings and other venues as well? Do you have any good toasts for us, Natalie? Yeah, I love making toasts because I think it just seals the the celebration. It's like the bow on the present, and it's a beautiful way for people to come together. And really, you know, you look into each other's eyes. You're there. It's a symbol of unity, and that's what toasting was in the old days. People would literally clink their glasses to make sure the wine spilled a little bit into each other's cup. Aww. Yeah. Well, and they were also making sure they weren't poisoning each other, but that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> but, uh, these days, it's, it's all friendly. So I think a toast is a great uh, way to start any celebration, and I have a few favorite toasts. I have a couple for weddings. I have one just uh, for friendship. Would you like me to share any sure, or all? Please. Go ahead. Okay. Well, here's a couple, two uh, short ones for weddings. The first one is, here's to the bride who is to be, here's to the groom she'll wed, may all their troubles be light as bubbles or the feathers that make up their bed. Oh, very nice. What if they have a campaign theme? What if they have a foam mattress? I'm sorry, I just sum up party pooper. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A shorter one, still on the sort of the bubbly theme, 
is uh, may your joys be as deep as the ocean and your cares as light as its foam. I really want to get on with the meal. And nice. the bubbly is getting warm. And then I really like this one, just when you get together with friends. And it doesn't have to be a formal dinner. It's just, I, I don't know, I just think it's nice. So, may friendship like wine improve as time advances. And may we always have old wine, old friends, and young cares. Oh. I like the old here's mud in your eye, but those are, <laughs> but those, are those are kind of nice. Those are kind of nice too. Hey Natalie, I, I think I think we need to leave it there. And I'm sorry, I could always talk to you every time we do a show with you. I think we should do two two parters and do a two show with you. Great, it's thanks. Been super to have you. Thanks so much, Natalie. Great chatting with you both, guys. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Mark Pascal and Francis Schott. I recommend you check out their restaurants in New Jersey. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one who's interested in the wine tips we discussed. My podcast is easy to find, whether you search Google on its name, on Reserve Wine Talk, or on my name. And if you want to learn why pairing wine to protein can be disastrous, join me in a free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. You'll find links to Mark and Francis's website, restaurants, and social media handles in the show notes, as well as a link to sign up for my free online video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 59. I can't wait to share more wine stories with you next week. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a wine that pairs well with protein, but not for the reason you think. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.